Hey, welcome to another video. So when geologists and paleontologists study the earth, the whole idea is to try to come up with a full picture of everything that's happened in our planet's history. And of course, this is very difficult to do because no human has been around for the entire length of time that the earth has been around. And even if a human was alive for the entire length of earth's history, which is approximately 4.6 billion years, that human would not have been living in every part of the planet, so that one person wouldn't know anyway. So there are a number of methods that scientists use to try to get a full picture of our planet's past. Today we're gonna to look at a process called relative dating. Okay, now first of all, this does not mean that you go out on a date with your cousin, okay? Completely icky and nothing to do with science. What relative dating would let us do is it would let us look at geologic events or fossils and put them in order from oldest to youngest. For example, this dinosaur fossil that I'm pointing to, is it older or younger than the T-Rex skull? And is that older or younger than this trilobite fossil? Relative dating allows us to sequence things in order from oldest to youngest. Okay? Now, there are a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. Because this is relative dating, it means that we're looking at the age of things relative to other things. So we're comparing objects. We're not going to figure out exactly how old things are. We're just going to figure out whether things are older or younger than other things. It would kind of be like looking at a, a family that has three children and saying, okay, this child's the oldest, this child's the middle, and this child is the youngest. We don't know how old they are, but we know the order that they were born. So, to kick this off, I'm going to show you how we would do this with this ice cream sundae. All right, so let's figure out what the first thing was that was put in this dish. Okay, so what do you think was put in there first? Well, you probably realize that it would have been the ice cream. And you can tell that because the ice cream is at the very bottom of the bowl. Okay, so now what was put in next? Well, was it the cherry? No, because the cherry is on top of something else. Was it the fudge? Was it the whipped cream or was it the brownie? Well, we can use some clues here to figure this out. Because the fudge is on both the ice cream and the brownie, it means the brownie had to be put in that dish first. And then the fudge came sometime after that. Now, did the fudge come immediately after that? Well, I also see fudge on the whipped cream. So that means the whipped cream had to be in here also before the fudge was put on. But was the fudge put on next or was the cherry put on next? Well, I don't see any fudge on the cherry. So chances are the fudge was put in there first and then the cherry was placed on top. So what geologists do is they use clues, kind of like what we just did, to order things from oldest to youngest. We're going to spend several days in class practicing this skill. By the end of our practice, you should be able to look at an image like this and basically list out all of the steps in order from oldest to youngest. So let's start learning how we do this. Okay, so we're going to go over some of the rules for how to identify the age of a rock. If you do this for a living, you are called a stratigrapher. And of course, the prefix here uh, comes from the word strata, which means layers. All right, here we go. Rule number one. The first rule is called uniformitarianism, which basically means that the present is the key to the past. None of us were alive two million years ago. So we're going to have to assume that what happened before is still happening today or what happens today also happened in the past. Okay, so if we understand the present, we will also understand the past. For example, we know today that when volcanoes erupt, they released, release many things, lava, gas, ash, all sorts of elements and compounds. 
we're going to assume that millions of years ago, volcanoes released the same things. Today, we know that fish live in water. We're going to assume that in the past, fish also lived in water. Today, when a stream enters a body of water with a current, like an ocean, we get horizontal sorting. We're going to assume that the same thing happened in the past. Okay, and there are lots of other examples. Rule number two, we've, we've looked at this in class, we haven't used the name, but this is called the law of original horizontality. So if you look at the picture of the Grand Canyon, if I wanted to know where the oldest rocks are found, where would they be? Well, we know that sedimentary rocks originally form in horizontal layers. So if we know that they were originally horizontal, we can then figure out which ones would be oldest and which ones would be youngest. And we do that by using what's called the law of superposition, which basically says that if you have a sequence of undisturbed rocks, now that is a key phrase there. By undisturbed, we mean that we still have these horizontal layers. If the layers are still horizontal, then the oldest layer is on the bottom and the youngest layer is on the top. If these layers were not horizontal, this law will not work or it may not work. So we can only use the law of superposition when the rocks are undisturbed. So if we look at this image of the Grand Canyon, they've, they've named the different layers and they have the ages here. You can see that the rocks at the bottom are the oldest. And as you travel upwards, the rocks get younger and younger. Okay, so as long as they're still horizontal, we make that assumption. Now, the fourth rule has to do with faults and folds. In this picture, we obviously have a huge outcrop of rock and there's a fault going through it. Well, which is older, the rock or the fault? Well, you can't get a fault unless you already have the rock. So the rock has to be older than the fault. Now in this image, we have some folded strata, some folded layers. Well, what's older, the folding or the rocks? Well, obviously we can't have folding unless the rocks were already there. So the fourth rule is that faults and folds are always going to be younger than the rocks that they cut through. Or you could flip that around. The rocks are always older than the faults and the folds. All right, so that's rule number four. Rule number five is pretty similar to that. Okay, the fifth rule has to do with cross-cutting relationships. So what we're looking at now is we're looking at intrusions where magma intruded or burned its way into a rock that was already there. Okay, so in this case, this light brown rock on the top and the bottom was there, and this magma then intruded into it. In this picture, the light gray rock was there, and the black formed when magma intruded into it. So what has to be there first? The rock? or the magma. Well, right. I mean, the magma intruded into the rock. So intrusions and extrusions are always younger than the rocks they cut through. Okay, rule number six. This is very cruel of me, but I want you to look at this picture. I wanna know what existed first, the M&Ms or the cookies. What existed first? Well, could you make the cookies before you had the M&Ms? No, obviously not. You needed the M&Ms in order to make the cookies. Now let's apply it, the same idea, to this conglomerate. What's older, the actual conglomerate or the pieces in it? Well, we could not get this conglomerate unless those pieces already existed. So the sixth rule says that fragments in a rock have to be older than the rock. 
Right? You can't have that rock unless you already had the pieces, unless you already had the fragments or the sediments or the shells or the minerals, whatever that rock is made of has to be there before the rock itself can form. Okay, rule number seven. This one has to do with contact metamorphism. So if you think back to our study of rocks, we know that when magma contacts rocks, it changes them and they become metamorphic. So all around this magma chamber, where this light red shading is, you would have contact metamorphism. As this magma moved underground, it contacted these other rocks and it changed them into metamorphic rocks. Contact metamorphism can provide a really important clue as to what was there first. The way that it works is that if there's contact, then it means the surrounding rock was there first and then the magma went through it and contacted the rock. So the magma is younger than the rock. If in this diagram there was no contact, well, that means that these layers were not there yet when the magma came through. So if there's no contact metamorphism present, it means the magma was there first. It's older than the surrounding rock. Now this one's a little bit tricky until we start to look at some examples. So let's look at one together. I'm going to put up a picture. In this diagram, there are several different letters and I have them all written on the bottom here. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to do some relative dating. We're going to try to arrange the letters or the layers of rock in order from oldest to youngest. Okay, so which layer, which letter formed first. Okay, well, let's use the law of superposition to start. Because these layers are still horizontal, we can assume that the ones at the bottom are older. So letter A is all the way at the bottom. So we're going to say that's the oldest. Now, the M is on top of it. So the M is going to be younger. And then you have the E is younger than M, followed by, I see an L, a C, and an S, okay? And they're gonna be in that order. So the L, and then the C, and then the S, okay? Now, we have two layers left. Here's the question. When did layer D form, and when did layer H form? Okay, so now we're gonna use the contact as the clue. When this magma came up through these rocks, it contacted layer A, M, E, and L. You see how it doesn't contact the C or the S? That means the C and the S were not there yet when D formed. So letter D had to form after the L, so it's younger than L, but it's older than the C and the S because it was there before the C and the S formed. Now, what about H? Well, I see contact on A, M, E, and L. So those four layers were definitely there first. This intrusion did not get up to C and S. So I don't really know if it formed before C or after C. All I know is it's got to be older than A, M, E, and L. I'm sorry, it's got to be younger than A, M, E, or L because it contacted them. So it could go anywhere after the L. It could go here, it could go here, it could go here. It could go anywhere as long as it's younger than the L. We'll do some more of this in class tomorrow. Okay, number eight. Environment of formation. We know that sedimentary rocks usually form underwater. So the sediments have to get in the water. The land has to sink underwater. We call that subsidence. Weathering and erosion generally don't happen underwater. They happen above water. So the land has to be uplifted out of the water 
before weathering and erosion. 